Hi, it's Ted Pazin from Critical Path Training. Let's talk about developing with the CDS for Apps Web API. Great new stuff. All the code that I'm going to show, there's going to be two different sample applications. One is a C Sharp console application. The other is an ASP.NET MVC application that's going to program against the Web API. But those are available, as are the slides that I'm showing you right now. So if you basically go to this location, github.com, critical path training, slash CDSA, Web API, that's basically where you can get all the resources here. Okay, now what I want to do just before I dive into the content is just give a shameless plug uh, to my company because we do hands-on training. If you like what we're going to talk about here today and you want more of this style training plus hands-on labs, uh, you know, note that we have courses for developers, Power BI Developer Boot Camp. We have some things that target Power BI embedding. Uh, if we list the courses right here, uh, maybe you're working with Power Apps and Flow. You know, so if I drill down into uh, this course right here, you know, what you can see here is a list of, you know, what are we going to cover over the two days. We have one on February 14th, Valentine's Day. Okay, that's enough marketing. Let's go ahead and move back to the slides and let's get into the program for today. So what I want to do is I want to start just with an overview of where the common data service for apps web API fits in. It's just a very awkward thing to say, CDS for apps web API. Uh, so maybe we'll just call it the CDSA web API. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about Azure Active Directory, how we create Azure AD applications, and then how we program them with the Azure Active Directory Authentication Library. Then we'll start programming the console application uh, against the API, just so we can do things like start looking at retrieving accounts, adding accounts. Uh, we're also going to start moving into um, looking at the metadata, you know, being able to retrieve or create option sets, being able to examine uh, or create custom entity definitions. And then at the end, we're going to push the pedal down, go a little bit faster, and talk about how to get all this code working, you know, inside of a web application that runs on the internet using best practice security. Okay, so let's go ahead and start out with you can program the common data service for apps, you know, using this older style approach, which is the organizational service. Now, let me go ahead and go back to the documentation here. So docs.microsoft.com, Power Apps Developer. So what you'll see here is that there's something for the common data service. And if you get inside here and I go down to work with data using code, you know, what you'll see is that there's two different things that we can use. The first is the organizational service. Now, this is a .NET library. You know, let's go back to the slides here. That is meant for developers who are using .NET. You know, so one of the issues is you have to use .NET to be able to use this library. And as you call into this library, it handles making SOAP-based calls into the XRM endpoints you know, that have been around for quite a while in Dynamics 365. Now, there's lots of existing code that's already written you know, against the organizational service. You know, so that will continue to be supported. But to some extent, that's the old way we've done things. And now we're moving to this new thing, which is the CDS for Apps Web API. So not much code is written against this yet because it's brand new. But what we're going to see is that this is based on emerging standards. So requiring developers to use .NET is not a realistic requirement for many development shops. So the idea of the CDS for A, the web API, you know, like many of the other APIs that Microsoft has introduced, introducing the Microsoft Graph API, the Power BI Service API, this fits in with just another API that once you learn the principles of REST OData, and once you learn how to authenticate with OAuth2 and OpenID, you're going to be able to program against this just as a, another one of the APIs that kind of fits into the current style of web-based programming. Uh, now, there's a downside, and that is you're going to have to actually manage the REST-based calls, and you're going to go directly into the endpoints. Now, what I can also say, and feel pretty confident saying that, is that this web API really represents the future of Microsoft's investment in the web API. So the primary goal is to grow out the web API. 
Microsoft also has this older issue where lots of code is written against the organizational service, which today behind the scenes is using SOAP. So there's been a lot of talk about how can we redo the guts of the organizational service so that much of the code you have written will continue to work, but instead kind of switching from the old SOAP-based XRM endpoints you know, to the new OData-based uh, and OAuth2 and OpenID-based web API. Now, how that will work out over the next couple of years remains to be seen. Uh, but also today, what's important is that there's no friendly .NET library like you might have with some other APIs. So for instance, if I'm using the Microsoft Graph API or I'm using the Power BI Service API, I can call directly into the endpoints like we'll be doing today with the CDS for web APIs. But those other APIs also have .NET SDKs that you can program against that kind of relieve the developer from having to make the calls and kind of convert the JSON over to .NET objects. You know, so using the CSA today, uh, you know, you might find it a little bit more low level than you have with other libraries. Okay, now what do you need to get started? Well, you're going to need Visual Studio. At least that's what I'm going to be using. Um, you need an Office trial tenant. Also, the user account that you're going to be using needs a Power Apps Plan 2 license because some of the things that you're going to be doing is you need to create environments, you need to create the CDS database, you need to start working with creating custom entities, and all that requires a Plan 2 license. And at the very least, even if you have users that are just reading and writing accounts, they're going to need at least a Power Apps Plan 1 license because that's the bottom licensing tier that a user needs to be able to touch the common data service for apps. Okay, now we're going to need access to the Azure portal. Now let's kind of go start by, go back, and here I am, you know, inside of a trial Office 365 tenant that I've created, and also I have given myself the Power Apps Plan 2 license. And so given the fact that I am the global tenant administrator and also I have the Power Apps Plan 2 license, I can now create new environments. Okay, now I've already created a couple different environments right here. The environment that I'm going to be using is CPT Dev. And note that when you create the environment or after you create the environment, you know, you have the option of adding the common data service for apps database. Okay, now here, what you can see is that I'm going to be using this one particular database. If I go to something like account and I can start seeing the different uh, entities that I'm going to be working with with the API, you know, let's go over to uh, data and just see, you know, currently I have just a couple different records inside here. Okay, now also before we go any further, let's go back and Let's say that what is the alternative to us writing a custom application? Well, we can basically use Power Apps and we can either create Canvas apps or we can create model-driven apps. You know, for instance, here is a demo of a model-driven app, you know, that requires absolutely no development and it allows my users to see things like accounts and contacts and to be able to work with those uh, inside there. Okay, now the next thing that I want to be able to do uh, is let's go over into Azure AD and inside of Azure AD, you know, I'm going to make sure I log on as an account that lives in the same tenant where I'm going to be running the application. In Azure AD, notice that I'm able to work with app registrations. We're going to talk about why these are important, but note that all your work of creating app registrations and whether you do it by hand or do it with PowerShell, you do not need an Azure subscription even though you're working you know, inside of the Azure portal. You really just need permissions you know, and to be a member of that tenant and you're going to be able to create these applications inside here. Okay, so now with that background, let's uh, go ahead and move into what we're going to be talking about. And the first one is going to be authentication with Azure AD. Now, the CDS for A, the CDS for A web API is going to be based on the current modern style of authentication 
that Microsoft is using across all the different APIs they're coming out with. You know, so we've left behind SOAP, we've left behind WS Fed style authentication, and we've moved to OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Now, the, the main idea of OAuth 2 is that you have a user and your application needs to do something not as the user, but on behalf of a user. So with OAuth, the idea is that you go through something called an authentication flow. And whoever the authentication server is, you know, what we might call the OpenID provider, is able to pass an access token to your application, which you're gonna to refer to as the client. Once you've got the access token, then your application, the client, can then call to a resource service, you know, what we'll just call a resource. And the idea is that resources are generally endpoints, like the Microsoft Graph API and the CDS A web API. And each time your application calls into this resource, it's gonna to have to pass an access token. But first, you have to be able to obtain an access token. So we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, how that's gonna work. Now, you're gonna to have to register a application in Azure AD for the custom application you're developing. Just like users need a user account, your application needs an account so it can be recognized as some type of a security principle. Now, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be moving in Azure AD and once again, everything I'm going to show here, I'm going to do things by hand, but you could absolutely automate this with a PowerShell script. You could automate it by calling into another API that allows you to create the Azure AD applications. Okay. Now, when we create an application in Azure AD, it's going to get an ID, which is basically going to be a GUID called the client ID, also known as the application ID. And some types of applications that we register are going to require a reply URL, which is actually an endpoint on the internet where our application lives. Okay, so for more secure applications, what we're going to do at the very end, you're going to see that if your application is registered without a reply URL, it won't work. If your application is registered with a reply URL, but your application doesn't live on the internet at that address, it's not going to work. However, when we're building things like a console application, you don't have you know, quite the degree of security protection. So the whole idea of the reply URL you know, being something that you can confirm as you know, where the application lives doesn't really exist. Now, as we create the application in Azure AD, it's going to have to track permissions. And what we're going to see is that all the different APIs, once again, whether it's the Microsoft Graph API, the Power BI Service API, or in our case, the CDSA Web API, they define their own permissions, and your application you know, must configure what permissions it requires. And we're going to go through and kind of see how that works. Now, without going into too much detail, when we start working with Azure AD, you're creating a client application. And there's lots of different scenarios. Your client application might run on someone's iPhone. It might run as a single page application, entirely written with client side code in the browser, or you might be writing kind of a more traditional ASP.NET MVC application. So depending on your scenario, there are different authentication flows. And remember the authentication flow is basically how we get the access token from Azure AD back to your application so it can start passing it as it calls in. Now, there are some authentication flows that are more secure than others. The one we're going to see at the end of this session is the authorization code grant flow. And the idea is that you have a confidential client, meaning that it can keep secrets generally over on the server side. And so it's going to give us a very robust way to get an access token. Now, sometimes you can't use the highest level of security. So there's another flow called the implicit grant flow. And notice that that's public. Now, the idea is that if everything that you're doing is JavaScript running inside the browser, some potential attacker can basically see everything that's there because you've pushed it all into the browser and between monitors or looking at what's inside the browser, 
you know, you can't keep any secrets because attackers could find them. So there's something called the implicit grant flow where we have to basically lower the security bar so we can pass an access token right back to the browser. In the authorization code grant flow, you'll see that the access token never passes through the browser, you know, but it's maintained over on the server, and we basically make server-to-server -server calls, you know, never giving an attacker a chance to steal the access token, you know, because it's not routing through the browser. Okay, now there's another flow, which is the user credentials flow or the user password credential flow. And that's the one that is least secure because we're just going to pass a username and password across the network. Now, there's another flow for when we want to do app-only authentication, which is called the client credentials flow. That's not going to be important to us because there's nothing about app-only authentication that's supported by the CDSA web API yet. Maybe in the future, you know, but every time we authenticate, it is as a specific user. Now, Azure AD, you know, plays the role of the OpenID Connect provider. And note that it supports, you know, both OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. You can think of the two as, you know, a single protocol. Now, with the Azure portal, we can see the things that we've created. So let's say that we want to do something. We'll go to Azure Active Directory inside of the Azure portal. You know, that's where I can also see users and groups. But what we're more interested in, you know, is registering an application. So let's say I go back here and notice that I already have a couple things uh, that are registered. Let's say I want to be able to access the CDSA web API from a simple C Sharp console application. Now, because it doesn't run on the internet, it doesn't run at a real endpoint. I can't use a more secure way to authenticate, you know, such as the authorization code grant flow. So instead, we're going to register this as a native client. Now, I'll call this something like, uh, you know, native uh, app one. Uh, and as I create that, I'm going to register it as a native app. And note that there is something which is called a redirect URI, which is often just the same thing as the reply URL. You know, it's the place on the Internet where Azure Active Directory is expecting your application to be. But if I have a native application, this is really just any old string. So I'm just going to put something like, you know, local uh, host uh, slash app one, two, three, four. Okay. So they're not going to enforce that your application runs there. But there are scenarios where when you authenticate, you have to pass that redirect URI, and it has to match something that is registered. Okay, now, once I create this application right here, you can see that you have something called the application ID. And one thing that you have to get right away is that there are two names for this GUID. Sometimes it's called the application ID. Sometimes it's called the client ID. Those are not two things, but over the last couple years, you'll find that as you move from the docs to the API to something else, it just they just keep changing the name back and forth, application ID, client ID, application ID, and you just have to say, it's the same thing. I wish we could just call it one or the other. Okay, now you're going to need the application ID for your application. Also, let's go ahead and click on settings. And if I click on settings, I can start seeing things like the redirect URIs. Now, it turns out here, uh, if we're going to be uh, using that, uh, what we might need to do is pass it in. So I might need to know this. And then finally, there is required permissions. Now, if I want to talk to the CDSA web API, I have to add a required permission. So we're going to go back here. And today, they have not changed its name yet. So it's called Dynamics 365 uh, CRM. Let's go ahead and hit select. And what permissions do I want? The one and only permission there is. Access Dynamics 365 as an organizational user. OK, so what's not supported today is for your application to get an app-only access token that doesn't have any users. You know, something like the Microsoft Graph API allows you to authenticate as a user or to authenticate as an app-only identity. You know, but there are no application level permissions. So there's no real reason that you would ever want to you know, get an app only access token.
Uh, also note, I'm going to go ahead and select OK here. Let's go ahead and I want to uh, say done. You know, and now we've got some uh, permissions in there. Let me say add. And let's say that I go to something like the uh, Power BI Service API. And we'll go ahead and add that in. Now, you're going to see that this one, you know, has a lot more permissions inside there. So what kind of struck me about the CDSA Web API is that there's no granularity in permissions for the application. All the granularity is in what roles you put your user in. And basically, it's all controlled, you know, within the context of the CDSA database, you know, using the kind of the old Dynamics 365 style. So you'll log on as a user. That user will just have this, you know, one permission. Let's go ahead and get rid of the uh, other API. And, you know, as I bring this up right here, this one permission basically gets me in the door. But it's really the configuration of what roles that user is in. Uh, and what roles, you know, what those roles allow the user can do. That's the whole granularity of security model. So it's actually kind of nice in a way that you don't have to worry about it at this level. There's just one permission switch to turn uh, on or off. Okay. So now that we've kind of seen that, creating the Azure AD, you know, creating a native application, we want to copy the application ID. And then if your web.config file says put the client ID here, you know the application ID and the client ID is the same thing. Uh, and we kind of just quickly went through and kind of showed you, you know, how you can configure permissions. Now, just to, uh, you know, uh, repeat a couple of the fundamentals. The resources that are secured by Azure AD can have two types of permissions. They can have delegated permissions, which only work when your access token has a user identity. And the idea is that your application will make a call, not as the user, but on behalf of the user. So the user is granting you and your application permissions to run with some subset of the user's permissions. Now, there's, only, there's also application permissions. But we don't have application permissions in the API that we're talking about here. We only have a single delegated permission. Okay. Now, another important thing is that when you begin to use uh, one of these applications, what you're going to see is that the very first time the user authenticates, what's going to happen is that Azure AD, after the user authenticates, then presents the user with a second dialogue so that the user can consent to basically the application, which then can take the required permissions and basically run on behalf of the particular user. Now, there are cases where this works out just great. The first time the user authenticates, it brings up this screen. The user clicks the steps, and we move on. There are other cases where you want to just pass a username and password blindly and kind of have a authentication, you know, without the need to interact. And what you'll see is that if we still require the user to um, to accept or grant these permissions, and you try to do some type of non-interactive login, it's going to fail. So in some applications, you know, after we create the delegated permissions, you know, let's go back here, uh, we might want to go back to where we have permissions, say grant permissions, because this is going to basically rid the need uh, of being able to, um, you know, have the need for the interactive login. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, that's a lot of background. Let's now kind of get up and going uh, with programming for the web API. So one of the things that we're going to need to do before we can call into the web API is we're going to have to call to Azure AD, and we have to go through this authentication flow. Now, for the app I'm about to show, we're going to use a very simple user password credential flow which basically the app is just going to pass the username and password and get back an access token. You know, as you get into more secure scenarios with applications that run out on the internet, you know, you're going to see that we get more security, but the authentication flow becomes a lot more uh, complicated. Okay. Also, once you get the access token, it does you no good until you start using it. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be propagating the access token in the authorization header 
every time we make a call into the CSA for um, the, the CSA uh, web API. Okay, sounds good. Now, let's go to my first application. Inside of my first application that we're going to be looking at right here, I'm going to go ahead and bring up NuGet packages. You know, just to be in full disclosure mode, what are we using? We're basically going to be using uh, two different NuGet packages. One is a .NET library, which is generally referred to as the Active Directory Authentication Library, or ADL. The second thing is we don't have a friendly .NET library, so we're going to be in charge of taking these responses that are JavaScript object notation and somehow you know, parsing out the data. So we're going to use a very common approach where we use the Newton.json converter, and we're going to basically have .NET classes. If I take a quick look at some of this code inside here, Note that we have CSA models. So when I want to you know, create a new account and basically create it with a post, or I want to retrieve a single account or multiple accounts, I have this class, which can be used you know, in conjunction uh, with the um, Newson JSON converter to quickly take the JSON and convert it into a .NET object just to give me an easier programming model. Okay, so you've kind of seen we're going to use the Active Directory Authentication Library. Okay, now here's some code, but instead of showing you that code, remember this application is something that you can download and start running. So let's go ahead and start off. I'm going to go ahead and close the models class here. And let's go ahead and we want to do the hello world. You know, we want to call across the network uh, and we want to display um, information about who this user is. Okay, now there's a, most of the code is going to live in this thing, which is the CDSA manager. Now, I'm going to need the client ID. So if I go back over here and we go back to our applications, and what we can see here uh, is that we have some particular uh, application. Let's see if I go to all apps uh, inside here, and we go back here, you know, which is the one that starts with OA uh, inside here. Okay, so I've called this one test rig. Probably should have a better name for that one. Uh, but you can see there is the application ID. You can see uh, over uh, here that you can have a redirect URI, and there are some scenarios where if you want an interactive login, you're going to have to pass a URI that matches one that is registered. And Azure AD is notorious for being finicky, and you pass one that has a uh, basically a forward slash on the end, uh, and the one that's registered doesn't, or you have one that's registered with HTTPS, but you pass HTTP, it doesn't work. It's got to be an exact match. Okay, and then we also have uh, these required permissions inside here. Okay, so once we've got that taken care of, the next thing that we have to do is let's go back and we have to figure out what is the URL to call into the CSA for my particular environment. So remember here that I want to pick my environment first. Okay, so that's my environment. Now there is a new little UI that pops up. So if I drop down where it says Advanced Customizations, notice that there is a Developer Resources here at the end. And if I open this page up, what you're going to see you know, is that magic little uh, URL inside there. For some reason, this takes uh, quite a few seconds to load. Uh, somebody in the cloud is scratching its head as we uh, wait for this to come back right here. Uh, any second now, here it comes back. And so here is the service root URL. You know, so what you can see here is you have this org, and then you have something that's kind of like a small grid that makes it unique. So you need to get this value. Note that there is another value that's not used, the unique name. You know, the one you want is the one that's in the service root URL. You know, also realize that, you know, the latest version is v9.1. So now let's go back here and note that, you know, I have that instance ID. And from that, we're going to start building some different things inside there. So down here, 
we're going to need something which is the authorization endpoint. So this is something where you redirect the user to or where you go to when you want to get an access token. Now, you can also see that we've taken this organizational um, <clears throat> or kind of the environment unique name, and we basically put it, you know, inside the CDSA instance name inside here. Okay, now, in another demo, I'm going to show you how you can discover what environments or what instances this user, you know, has access to. You know, so there's also this discovery URL. And note that probably I should uh, split this down here just because this one builds on what's above. So right above this selected line, we have the CDS instance URL. But then I just take that and I add slash API slash data slash V9.1. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and, you know, see how we can get an access token. So inside the Active Directory Authentication Library, you know, there is a authentication context. And I'm going to pass the authorization endpoint. What is that authorization endpoint? You know, it's just this thing that doesn't really change. Note, as you move from the Active Directory Authentication Library version 3 to version 4, some people used uh, a bunch of stuff after the word common. Uh, so common and OAuth token. And that was a breaking change. So as you move to ADL version 4, you know, make sure that you don't have anything beyond the word common. Or you could also put in the GUID for your tenancy instead of having common inside there. Common, in some scenarios, is just a little bit more flexible because you don't have to hard code uh, the GUID for a specific um, uh, Azure AD tenant inside there. Okay, now, for get access token, here, one of the things that we can do is we can basically say we want to use the uh, platform parameters inside there. Okay, and then we're going to be able to acquire an access token. And what do we need to hand it? Well, here's the resource URI. So when you get an access token, one of the things that you need is you need to be able to say, here's the thing I want the access token for. Okay, now, <clears throat> when we get an access token, and let's go ahead and run something very simple right here. I'm going to go back here, and we're going to run this. Also, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Fiddler, and let's go ahead and run this right here. And so what I have here is a very simple way to authenticate, where basically you're just passing a username and password so you don't get prompted. Now... If I go back here to Fiddler, you know, what you're going to see is the very first thing that we did is we basically made this call across the network. And here you can see, you know, in the body of this request, you know, that it's passing the username, it's passing uh, the password. And what does it get back? You know, it gets back this access token uh, down here. Okay. Now, once we have the access token, you know, let's go here and take a look at this one particular call across the network. And once again, your slash API slash data. Now, if I go back and we look at the headers, what you're going to see is when we start using OAuth and we make calls in, we're going to have to pass an access token inside there. So once we get the access token, let's go back here. Let's go back to the manager right here. What we can do is if we know the thing we want an access token for, we're able to basically create an authentication context and we're able to call in and get that. Now, in particular, my application is using this thing, which is the get access token with unattended access. So here, what I'm doing is I'm using the new password credential object. And that's what allows us to, in a non-interactive fashion, reach across the network get back an access token. Now, if I go down and I look at this first function down here, remember you have access to all this code. I'd really love for some of you to start kicking the tires. Uh, we basically get the URI, you know, to the base URI. And because the older organizational service with SOAP supported the who am I entry point or operation, the REST API does as well. 
So here, if I simply add that inside there, once again, you can kind of see who am I, open and close paren. Well, now we're going to call execute get request. So when I call execute get request, sorry, I'm moving around kind of fast here. Let me get just to uh, the execute get request inside. Now, what you're going to see uh, here is that we're going to create a new HTTP client so earlier when I said no friendly .NET library to help you with this, so if you review something like in SharePoint, the client-side object model, you just call methods on an API and it takes care of making the calls behind the scenes. That's not the case. You're executing the calls, you're passing data in the call, you're harvesting data using JSON when it comes back. Okay, so here we create the HTTP client, we create a request message, and here is you're kind of doing the low-level security work, of adding the authorization header, putting in the word bearer, and getting the access token inside there. And you know, once again, what this results in is you being able to make calls in. Remember, once you get an access token, it's good for basically an hour. So you can hold on to the same access token, you know, and make a thousand calls over the next five minutes without having to get another access token. Now, what I'm not going to really have time to go into in this introductory session, uh, you know, is basically uh, what happens when your access token expires. Well, there's refresh tokens and there's a, basically a way to get a, re, a fresh access token using refresh tokens. Now, another thing to note is that if you're doing a lot of work with Fiddler here, I'm going to go over to the, um, to the filter mechanism inside here. You know, so if I go to filters, and then I say turn on filter. I got browser windows open. I've got all this crap here I don't want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the URLs I do care about and I'm going to say load those inside there and run this filter set now. Okay, so now as I start looking at things, I only get back uh, the things I care about. Okay, now next thing I want to look at here is that all the other examples that I'm going to show except for the next one basically get an access token for a particular environment and it's going to have this org code inside here. So now what I want to do is I want to kind of show how you can discover what instances or what CDS databases this user has access to. So there is another endpoint which is globaldiscocrmdynamics.com. Let's go back here. Let me go ahead and uh, comment this out. Let me go ahead and uh, uncomment this. And, you know, let's go ahead and run this right here. And so, you know, as I run this, it's going to be a little bit uh, easier if I come back here and kind of take a look. So we call out inside here. Now, one thing to note is that because this is a different endpoint, it requires a different access token. So basically, I have to call in and get an access token for this endpoint and once I do that, I can make a call into API Discovery v2.0 instances. And so you can see, you know, what's coming back over here is this set of values. You know, because this application is a proof of concept application, you know, I've created for you and me to kick the tires with this. If I go back here and we take a look at something like, uh, you know, display uh, who am I, uh, or we look at the uh, discovered instances, you know, after I make the call, I'm also creating a JSON file and storing it here. So, for instance, if I open up this that was just created, you know, one of the things that I can say is, you know, here is the, the data that's coming back inside there. Okay, so now you've kind of seen, you know, how we get around. You know, let's look at some, you know, real application development. So, let's say that I want to go ahead and I want to display the accounts uh, or I want to uh, display uh, my contacts. So here we'll go ahead and uh, run this one more time. And what you're going to see here is, let me go ahead and uh, get rid of all this other stuff right here. So if I just go to the end of the endpoint and say slash accounts and I make sure I pass the authorization header, well now I get back, you know, basically uh, data you know, for all the different accounts.
Now, true, if I had 100,000 accounts, so I wouldn't bring them all back at once. You know, I use some kind of paging algorithm. You know, but once again, this is a standard REST style OData interface. You know, so being able to page through data with dollar sign top and dollar sign skip, you know, is basically the way that you would, um, you know, work your way through a really large set of accounts or a really large set of contacts, you know, as opposed to dealing with them, you know, all in a single um, <coughs> request. Let's go back here. And what I want you to do is kind of dig into some of this code. So let's kind of step through a little bit more of it. If I want accounts, notice that here I have to execute this. I get back accounts inside there. If I go back here and kind of look, what's the data that's coming back? So here's the case right here where we're going to use this trick. I know what the JSON looks like. Note that there's this trick here where if I uh, look at this uh, code right here, and then I you know, basically grab all that uh, code, and actually, let me do it with contacts here. It might be a little bit easier. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, grab all this inside here. Let me see if I can now open up Notepad uh, and quickly do something where uh, we'll take this and, okay, I might not do this very well. In fact, <coughs> I'm going to give up on the demo I was just trying to do, but there is a way that you can take the JSON uh, and go to a very friendly website. So if I go to uh, Google here and we do JSON uh, to, uh, <coughs> you know, basically C Sharp, and the idea is that there's a little website here, so if you get a JSON fragment put inside here, it will basically spit out a C-sharp class. Now, and the idea here is that when I go back and we take a look at my model classes, so here's models and I have account. If I have this account class right here, and I also you know, have a accounts collection class, you can take the response and simply serialize it. So back here in the CDSA manager, note that once I make the request and I have the JSON, I can now simply uh, convert it using my converter classes. And now I can simply enumerate through the accounts and get accounts.value to get that array. And then I can basically spit out you know, all the different account names there. Now, let's say that I want to uh, add an account uh, or I want to delete an account. OK, let's go ahead. And if I go back here, uh, let me start with a delete all accounts. Okay, so if I go ahead and I run uh, this operation, note today with the web API, there's nothing that you can do to delete multiple accounts in a single round trip. You know, that's something we definitely need, but it's something that, you know, it's not going to be in the initial wave of features we get in the API. So for each one, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have a delete request we're going to figure out, you know, what is the ID, you know, of that particular account and put that inside there. Now, if I go back to the browser and inside of the browser, let's go back to uh, our application here. And that's not what I want. I want this one. You know, let's go ahead and uh, look at accounts right here, and I have no accounts. Okay, so now let's go ahead and add a couple accounts inside here. So back here, we'll go ahead and we'll say uh, add account. Back here in the CDSA manager, you know, under add accounts, I have a little code that is able to kind of generate some random data. You know, but now we're going to take that C sharp class for account that we've created. And we're going to populate it. And then we're going to basically call into add account. If I look at add account, what it's going to do is take this .NET object and serialize it. So now you have the body for the request. And now we're going to basically call another routine, which is execute post request for CDSA. So back here, if I now kind of look at this helper method, what you're going to see is that this creates the HTTP content, 
It takes that JSON, puts it together uh, inside of the body. Now, let's go ahead and run this right here. You know, what we should see here is, let me go ahead and remove all that. And now what you can see is, you know, we're adding one account at a time inside here. You know, if I go back and I kind of look at the JSON, you know, that we're basically passing inside here. Now, some of the things that get to be a little bit tricky uh, inside here is that since we have this .NET object, let's go back to models and go back to account. Note that there are some things that if I want to bind and I want to create a account that has a primary contact uh, or I want to create a contact and associate it uh, with a particular um, <clears throat> uh, object or a, a contact, I have to add things inside the JSON. Now, let's go back here. And I have something else which is going to add a lot of things at once. You know, so here, let's say we want to populate the CDSA. And maybe before we do that, I'm going to call this uh, delete all accounts, delete all contacts. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this right here. Uh, but one of the things I want you to see inside here, okay, so first it's going to be doing all the delete activity. Uh, once it's done with that, now it should be adding things back in. And once uh, our data is back inside here, what I want to show is, you know, how we create relationships, you know, between a contact and an account. So let's say that we add a particular contact. Okay, so we have our friend Franco Bellina. Uh, and now what we're able to do uh, is execute this. As the data comes back, you know, let's go ahead and look at the headers. Uh, one of the things that you'll note here is that we have to basically pull the entity ID, you know, not out of the JSON body, but out of the headers that come back. Once you are able to get that entity ID, what we can now do is we can turn around and we can create a primary contact. Now, here's one of those things where you need to have a JSON uh, object that has primary contact ID at odata.bind, but in my C Sharp class, you'll note that you can have that be a name of a C Sharp property. So the JSON converter allows you to kind of put property names. So when your JSON, you know, has to use something that's not valid C Sharp, you know, we're able to, you know, get that in place right there. Okay. Now, if you play around with this a little bit more, uh, you know, just to show some of the other things that I've added, you know, inside of this sample, um, you know, is that I might want to get information uh, about a about the global option sets. You know, so let's kind of work with uh, metadata inside here. Let me go ahead and uh, comment those out. Uh, you know, let's go ahead and run this right here. And in our case right here, the console gives me too much stuff for me to really make sense of. Uh, but what we can see here is that, you know, as I called option sets, you know, I basically get back the information about all the different option sets that we have. Also, in my sample application, you know, I made it so that when we're making these calls, it's also going to generate these files behind the scenes. And if I do a control KD, now I can kind of inspect and kind of see what option sets look like if I want to retrieve them, if I want to create them and push them in. Okay, now let's kind of finish up by talking about how to create a custom entity. Now, custom entities I've just started working with, so I can't claim expertise, but I can claim I can make it work, get Hello World working, and share that with you. So when you pull back data for an entity, you know, whether it's an out-of-the-box standard entity or a custom entity, it's going to look like this. So what I've done is I've put together, you know, the JSON body to create something uh, inside there. Now, if we go back uh, here, and let's go ahead and get rid of all that. And now let's go ahead and call the one that's going to create the uh, custom entity inside here. 
And as I run this, let's see if I'm lucky and I can get this thing uh, to work inside here. You know, so here's just basically one call through the web API, you know, to take my JSON definition of my custom entity uh, and create that inside. Okay, if I look back here, uh, okay, I see that there's something that uh, I did wrong. Uh, could not find an entity with that name. Okay, that was my delete if it's there. Okay, now we go ahead uh, and create this inside here. And if I look at the uh, response, okay, looks like it's uh, still uh, running inside there. Okay, if this comes back, Hopefully, it will come back any second now and kind of show me that I have uh, created a uh, new custom entity inside there. If I go back here and we go ahead and uh, do the refresh inside here, and we now look at entities. Let's see if we have a uh, products entity inside. Um, click up there, back here, and <coughs> okay, it looks like um, okay, my uh, bad here, I've got some kind of an error, um, and if I take a look at the error message itself, uh, could not find an entity with a specified name, okay, that was the delete, now we have this one inside here, and 204, actually that looks like it did work out, it just took a second, let's go back one more time and uh, refresh this inside here, just to see if now we can go down and uh, find the uh, product entity. Okay, not seeing. Oh, here it is, Acme product. You know, that's what my entity is called right here. So back here, just to kind of give you a starting point, note that my sample application, you know, once again, just kind of uses this starting point for the JSON definition. And if I kind of look under attributes, you can see that I'm adding, you know, kind of the fields to the custom entity type, you know, product name, uh, different things inside here. Okay, so once again, you know, giving you some ability to create the, um, a custom entity. Okay, now there's one more demo. I don't have all that much time to show this, but what I wanted to do is kind of step through and kind of show you the beginnings of getting this working, you know, in a real web application, you know, as opposed to a console application. So some of the issues is that the authentication becomes more complicated because it's much more secure. So you're going to create your Azure application as a web app, and you're going to have a sign-on URL, which then becomes your reply URL, and your application has to be running at that endpoint, and whether you're in development and it's a local host endpoint, or whether your application's in production and it's something like myapp.azurewebsites.net, your application has to be running at that location for Azure AD to pass you an access token. Now, not only do you need the reply URL, you're also going to have to create a key. And so one of the things about what we're about to use, the authorization code grant flow, is that you need an application password. Now, at a high level, Here's the way things are going to work. Let's go back, and I'm going to move from the application I've been demoing so far. Let's go ahead and close that down. Let's go ahead and uh, open up this other application. This one is the CDSA uh, Content Manager. And what you'll see here is that if we go back to Azure AD, and we take a look at the CDSA Content Manager, you know, it has an application ID. It also, under settings, has a reply URL. Note that, you know, as I start up this application, you know, here I am in the development environment, uh, but what I have to kind of be sure of is that, you know, wherever I'm running, uh, <clears throat> and I'll show you how to fix this problem in just a second, uh, but wherever I am running, you're going to have to have that registered here because it's only going to pass back a particular access token if you are running at a URL that is registered. Note that you're not limited to one. You can register many reply URLs. And then finally, you have a key. 
Now, I've already configured the key, but to create a key, you simply give it a name, you give it a duration, and you click on Save. And then you have this one-time opportunity, uh, you know, after the uh, key. Uh, let's go ahead and click on Save. And I think it needs a refresh before I'm going to be able to do that because I've left that screen up for a while. But let's go back to Settings and Keys. And if I add in a key, which is key two, I give it a duration, and I go ahead and click Save. Okay, some reason I'm getting an error there. But what you'll be able to do is take that key uh, and take it and be able to um, <coughs> uh, copy it into your application. Now, when we when you load in this application, there's uh, an error that you might get because you have to rebuild and get the Roslyn compiler. So if you want to run this application, when you open it up, first thing I want you to do is to do a right-click project clean and then a right-click project rebuild. And that's going to restore all the packages, you know, which includes the Roslyn C-sharp compiler, which is needed to make the application uh, run. Once I've done that, let's go ahead and run this right here. Now, <clears throat> when this thing loads in, I'm going to go ahead and uh, sign in. Now, also, let's go ahead and go back to Fiddler, clean everything out. Let's go back here and go through this sign-in process. So the idea is that, you know, once the user signs in, what happens is that, and actually, I want to sign out and do that one more time because there was a cast sign-in from before, so you didn't see the whole experience. So let me sign out, then sign back in. So this time when I sign in, what you're going to see is you get brought to a standard Microsoft page. You know, so the idea is that when your application redirects to common OAuth 2 authorized client, and in our case right here, if I go look at web forms, you know, you can see that your application, you know, points to a URL and has a lot of query string parameters, you know, and what that allows uh, the application to do, you know, is to basically get back a access token inside here. And you can kind of see that my application has gotten the access token back. As I work with this application, and one caveat is this application, you know, is a work in progress, you know, but what I've done is I've kind of used the same code to be able to, you know, show you the different accounts that we have uh, inside here, you know, and to be able to uh, delete all these accounts at once, uh, and then to be able to um, add new accounts inside there. You know, so the same code we showed before, I can add one new account, I can click on the button to add five new accounts, okay, and we also have code to, you know, show things like the custom entities that you're working with, I've got some code that can show you things like the publishers and code that can show you the environments, you know, the discovered instances uh, that this user has access to. Okay, so once again, both these applications I just started this year, or actually I started them over Christmas, and I'm kind of hoping to grow them out over the next six months, you know, to have kind of some good starting places. But I think there's enough there uh, for all of you to, uh, you know, begin kicking the tires, working along with me. You know, please send me, um, you know, any type of information, if you have questions or if you've got successes uh, and have done some neat things and you want to show me, I'd love to see that. So that is our program for today.